All right, let's get started. Good morning, everybody. Hope we had a nice evening and day since we last met. I'm still Dr. White, your host, and this is Chem 1211. Good news. Dr. White is once again an internet or YouTube star. And if you haven't seen my announcement, I posted yesterday's Zoom meeting on YouTube. Blackboard has a limit. And there's another one which I don't know how to use, which you can do a link to that other site. I think it's called EULA or something like that. I got an email this morning. I'll use YouTube. Uh, it works well. And in case you're wondering how to do it, All right, where's my browser? Hang in there. If you go to Google, and you put in, I made it real simple. I also have the put in Kemi, don't forget the I, 1211 Zoom, and you'll see videos. Look, it's me, the YouTube star. And you'll see, I kind of changed the thumbnail. I got to get a better picture or close my mouth. But if I go like this, you'll see. Good morning, everybody. Deja vu again. <laughs> Sounds familiar. Anyways, this will be up in my YouTube channel. I only have one video today. I'll do today's, later today, I'll do today's video. And if you miss a class, or not really a class, our Zoom meeting, you can go and look and find this. All right, uh, important change, sort of. Um, instead of me just hanging around for a whole hour and nobody showing up to my office hours, usually most people don't go to office hours, but they're available if you need them. What I will be doing now is I'll stick around for the first 15 minutes. Nobody shows up. I'll check in at 6.30 and also at a quarter to seven. And if nobody shows up at a quarter to seven, I'll shut down. Now, if you're planning on going to my office hour and getting there a little late, let me know by email and I'll be there for you. And uh, I have it from six to seven. If the class thinks there's a better time when I'm available and you're available, let me know and we'll change it because nothing's written in stone in my class, which is a good thing. All right, I promised today I would go through the problem set on chapter two. This is summer, we're moving quick. Think about it this way, we're now in, if we're in fall or spring, the second week of class. Boy, time flies when you're having fun with chemistry. Now, the way I do problem sets is I do one page at a time. If you have any questions on any of the ones on that page, let me know. In the class, I'd say, raise your hand or ask, here, just turn on your mic and ask a question. Uh, by the way, can you keep a secret? Practice problems after test one, you'll know why I call them practice problems. Hint, hint, wink, wink, say no more. All right, first one, write the following numbers in scientific notation. This is a skill you should know. How do you do that? You put the decimal point to the right of the first non-zero number, and then any zeros at the end when the number is greater than one, you drop. So here we have one, two, three, four, five. 
one, two, three, four, five, to get the decimal point to the right of that. Remember, this is y times x times 10 to the nth. When the number is greater than 10, n is positive. When it's less than 1, n is negative. So we moved it five times, dropped the zeros, and that's how you do this. Here we got a big number. And again, you move the decimal point to the right of the first integer. Notice I have some of these. I helped you out. I put an arrow. And when it's greater than 10, you drop the zeros, not the non-zero numbers. And here we are. And I moved it nine times. And so that'd be 4.567 times 10 to the ninth. Now, for a number less than one, you do the same thing. Move the decimal point to the right of the first non-zero integer, or, or integer, which is non-zero, non-zero number. And here we move that one, two, three. Keep the 5.67 times 10. Since this is less than one, it's minus three. And same thing here. And hopefully you did these on your own. Now, how do you go the other way around? And say on a test, this might be these questions, I don't know, two points each. Oh, I think I just gave something away. Now here you do this the opposite. If we look here, notice the N is positive. So you move your decimal to the right. Time out for some, this is right, this is left. Right, left. And if we look here, we have nine points, uh, 7.98 times 10 to the seven. So I move it one, two, uh oh, what do I do after that? You fill the other five with zeros, and that's how you do it. Now, when the number is negative, 10 to the nth, notice I have little arrows there in case you missed it. It's a negative number. You move your arrow to the left and your decimal, not the arrow. And here, it's minus four. Well, I do this one. Uh oh, I need three more. You put three more zeros. One, two, let's see, one, two, three, four. Now, Dr. White doesn't like to change good habits, and I put a point zero in front of a decimal. You do not have to do that. If you just put point zero zero three seven six eight, that's fine. That works for me. Oh, I better tell you something important. Did I tell you I'm that close to the person who grades the test? Me. So when I tell you this is okay, you know that. By the way, you have everybody else on Zoom right now as witness I said that. And again, like I said the first day, it's easy to see me do this, like watching how to ride a bicycle, but until you get on and fall off once or twice, it's not that easy. And the question is, do you wanna fall off on the problem set or on the test? Hopefully all said the problem set, not the test. And this will help you get a good grade, which I assume most of you want. All right, now if I pass something you'd want me to do, always feel free to break in and ask. Remember, in my class, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Always feel free to ask questions. All right, next question, number three. We're at two or three points each. How many significant figures are in the following numbers? Let's go through this. All non-zero numbers are significant. Zeros at the beginning of a number are not significant. 
zeros at the end of a number without a decimal point, without, are also not significant. Zeros at the end with a decimal point are significant, and zeros in between two integers are significant. So if we look at A, oh, all non-zero numbers, one, two, three, four, and five. Oh, I got it right. Now, if we look at B, we have one, two, three, non-zero. Uh, ooh, a zero. It's at the end, no decimal points, so that's three. Let's look at C. Ooh, two non-zero numbers, but I've got a zero. And it's in between two numbers, and therefore it's significant in three. If I look at E, zeros in the beginning are always non, are not significant. Non-zero numbers are, therefore this would be three. Let's look at the fun one, my favorite, G, and that is how many significant figures does this number have? Well, all non-zero numbers are significant. That is one, it is a one. That's another one. And that's the third one, so that's three. Now I've got zeros. Zeros at the end with no decimal point are not. Zeros in between confined are, so this one would be, this would be significant. So it's one, two, three, four, five. I got it right, yay. Now, zeros at the end of a number with a decimal point are significant. And here, notice we have a decimal. Non-zero numbers are significant. One, two, the zero is, that's why we get three. This is never considered 10 to the whatever power, negative or minus, is never considered when you're doing significant figures. Now, let's look at another one, say two points each. Round off the following numbers to three significant figures. Probably not today, but maybe tomorrow I'll talk about uh, the importance of three significant figures and why sometimes Dr. White gets into a rut of three significant figures. But well, let's look at this one. How do you round off a number? Three significant figures, you keep the first non-zero number, next significant figure, next one. The fourth one is used to round off. This is four or less, no. If it's five or greater and it's past the decimal, you drop that and the one in front is increased by one. Same thing here, one, two, the zero is significant because it's between two numbers. This is the number used to round off. Is it uh, four or less or five or greater? And time's up, hopefully you can all pick five or greater. It's past the decimal, I'll drop it and I'll increase this by one. Now, when the number is greater than 10, and I'm gonna round this off to three significant figures, keep the one, keep the zero, keep the one. I'll use the three to round off. Is that four or less? And the answer is yes. I'll drop it, but I'll replace it with one. Students get a problem with doing something like this because they drop the whole number and you get 101. And 101 is not anywhere near 1,000. So don't forget to do that. Now, most of the time, like just about every time, we'll be working with a calculator, which will give you, when you're in scientific notation, numbers like, do I have one? Oh no, I don't. Would be numbers like A and or F, actually like A, and you'll round off there. Oh, let's do one more. Let's look at F. Round this off to three significant figures. Use the first non-zero number, significant figure, five. Second one is eight, third is seven. 
The one to round off is three. Notice that's four or less, that and everything else when you're past the decimal, you drop and that's how you do it. All right, let's look at the following two or three points each. What is the correct answer for? Now, on each of the tests, underneath where you have your name on the PDF file also, you'll be able to download, which will be the test. You'll take it at home, because obviously we're not coming to a classroom right now. It's an internet course, and also COD is still essentially closed. What it will say is, time out for a tea drink first. Please use proper significant figures for all calculated answers. And if you don't and have the wrong significant figures, I'll take off one point. I'll put minus one SF, which means significant figures. And if you have five or six problems and you don't do significant figures right, when you do calculations, and the first and second tests, mainly our multiplication division, you'll lose five or six points, which I don't think you want to. So remember, this is an important skill. Now, how do you do multiplication division? You get the same number of significant figures in your answer that has the, your answer has the same number of significant figures as the number you're multiplying or dividing that has the lowest significant figures. So if we look at 2a or whatever, a, 5a, we have this number, two significant figures, this number four, which is the lower number. Hopefully I'll pick two. Your calculator gives you a number like this. Now you have to round this off the two significant figures, keep the three, keep the four, use the nine to round off, it's past the decimal, that's five or higher, this all gets dropped, this gets increased by one, which is two significant figures. If we look at B, multiply this by this, your calculator gives you this huge, highly significant figures, lots of significant figures numbers, which is not the right answer. This has five significant figures. This has four. Therefore, when you round it off, we get this is what you get from your calculator. How many significant figures should your answer have? You should have the same number of significant figures in your answer as the number that you're multiplying or dividing that has the fewest significant figures. Hopefully you all know three is less than five. And therefore, you have to round this off to three significant figures. Keep the nine, keep the eight, keep the six. I use this double squiggly line sort of to show that's the number you round off. No, you don't have to put that on a test. I'm showing you this to help you. And is that four or less? Yes. So I drop all of this, and the correct answer would be 98.6. Now, E, I made a mistake. Hold on. Oh, I made a mistake. And luckily, one of your colleagues let me know. And let me do something real quick. I'm putting it into the spreadsheet right now. And this is the number my spreadsheet gives me. Wow. Now, if we look at the go back, 
and bear with me, for E, this is four significant figures. This is six, which is the lower number, four, which is the wrong number I have here. But let's look at how you do the right one. How do you round this off to, did I do it wrong again? I don't know. How do you round this off to four significant figures? Keep the six, keep the two, keep the seven, keep the one. That's my four. I'll use this to round off. It's four or less. So this is, let's do it down here. 6.271 E, which is 10 to the eighth in a spreadsheet. And that's, and I don't have this formatted right to four significant figures, but it should be 6.271. Let's see if I made my same mistake again. I did. Anyways, I'll post the right answer. Uh, sometimes when you're doing things in a hurry, you mess up again, and I did. Let's go to a division. Let's look at H. H, you're dividing this number by this. I see someone is going to help me out. This one for, oh, whoever had the question, which problem are you asking about? Anyways, let's look at H. H has one, two, three, four, five, six significant figures on top, has two here. You do the math, your spreadsheet or calculator gives you this number and therefore you have to round it off to two significant figures. Keep the one, keep the five. Look at this number to round off. Is it four or less or five or higher? And eh, time's up. It's five or higher. You drop all this since you're past the decimal. Increase this by one. Keep times 10 to the ninth. And that's how you do multiplication division. Remember, multiplication division. You get the same number of significant figures in your answer that has the same number as the number you're multiplying and dividing that has the lowest significant figures. Now for addition, it's a little different. And if you notice, I don't have any subtraction. So I don't think we do any the whole course. And here, addition is you get the same number of significant figures pass the decimal to the right as the number that has the fewest significant figures past the decimal to the right that you're adding. And hold on. Okay. Uh, what I'm doing when I, I see someone putting something in chat and I'll read it, sort of the same as if somebody asked a question. Let's look at number C, and if we add it up, this is the number we get on your calculator. Now, again, on test number one, two, three, four, and five, and I assume departmental final, I still haven't found out if they're going to give one. You get the same number of significant figures past the decimal point as the number that had the fewest significant figures past the decimal point. This has, here's the decimal point, one, two, three, four. Oh, notice Dr. White was nice. He showed you how many circled it. This one has one. So your answer should have one past the decimal. Keep the one, keep the six. First uh, significant figure past the decimal. And then you use the seven to round off. That's five or higher. This all gets dropped. This gets increased by one, this is the correct answer. If you notice, I don't have too many of these because we'll do most, you'll do start doing this in test two material and we'll come back and I'll repeat that. All right, 
Any questions about problem set two? Going once, going twice. Dawn, oh, I do have a question. Yeah, can we go over one of the longer ones from number five? Like, pick one. E or D, like in dog. E or D, just any of them. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Thank you. All right, here, because of significant figures, my calculator gave me this one, but it still works because 10, this would be 10 to the minus two, and this is what you get on your calculator. Now, let's look at this. How do you know what to do? You multiply the two numbers, and don't forget this. Uh, tomorrow, after class, for anybody who wants to stick around, I will go through how to use a calculator with scientific notation, okay? And since you're working at home, if you promise not to tell anybody, if you wanna use a spreadsheet, you can use that too, either way. But anyways, let's look at D. D, you have two significant figures here. Are you with me? I can see your video, Katrina. So just, now, here, how many significant figures in a number? Count them. All non-zero numbers are significant. One, two, three, four, five. And I made a mistake. Oh no, this should be a five. That should be a five. Dr. White makes mistakes, sorry about that. Hold on a second, gotta get my pointer back. So this would be one, two, three, four, five. This would be two, still get the same answer. You agree that two is less than five. Therefore, how do I round this off to two? I keep zero in the front is never significant. Look at the first non-zero number, second one. I use the third, because I'm trying to round off to two significant figures to round off. Is that four or less or five or higher? And zero is four or less. So everything past here is dropped and this becomes 0 0.21, okay? Let's see if I can get this right again. All right, we have, and hold on while I write this down. All right, we have these two numbers right here. First of all, let's see if I did it right. This is one, two, three, four. That's where I made my mistake. This should be five. I'm going home. I made too many mistakes today. Goodbye. No, I'm just kidding. I'm so embarrassed. Now I know why I made my mistake on here. All right, this should be five, this should be six. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, how do you round this off to five significant figures? Keep the six, keep the two, keep the seven, keep the one, keep the three. Look at the four, this number, which is number five, and that's four or less, and therefore you drop it, and the right answer here should be 6.2713. And that's where I made my mistake. Well, there goes my perfect score on this test. Now, Katrina, did that help you out? No, I kind of, I, I, no, it's, it didn't. <laughs> Sorry. 
where are you having problems? Um, how are you getting all of the numbers to like the like the six point two seven one three two? I'm putting that in my calculator. Where does that come from? Like I see you got five. All right. All right. Here's how that I mean. Where does this number come from? Yeah. How I'm do you make in a calculator or a spreadsheet? You multiply this times this. All right. So Let me you show you something. Here, let's do this. With all of the zeros on it? Or... Now, all right, hold on. I'll tell you what. Let's do this. Can you stick around a couple minutes right after class? Um, uh, Not two minutes. Two minutes is fine, yeah. I'll show it to you then because I'll do this and you'll see it's easy. Okay, thank you. Well, hold on, let me do it right now. You shouldn't have to wait. All right, let's do one like this. Now, E means X times 10 to whatever power in a spreadsheet. So let's say, so this is the same as saying 2.01 times 10 to the third. Are you okay? And if you're going to, all right, this is the number that you've got to multiply. If you're going to multiply two numbers, let's do this right down here. You understand that, right? Oh, I got it right, four. So my spreadsheet's working. But here, it automatically, let's do this again. E, and I'll show you on a calculator tomorrow, anybody who wants to learn. You do something similar, sine 10 to the squared. So that's the first number I'm multiplying. Then I'm going to multiply it by another number. This. This is 6.125 times 10 to the fourth. Now, before I hit the plus sign, because if I did this or the enter sign, if I did this on the board, you'd see this. How many significant figures? Remember, this is x times 10 to the squared. That's what e means. This is 10 times 10 to the fourth. Okay. Now, how many significant figures in this number? One, two, three. Zeros that are confined and zeros past the decimal are significant. Non-zero numbers are significant. So the first one that I'm multiplying has three significant figures. Here, all non-zero numbers are significant. One, two, three, four. The e to the fourth is 10 to the n, or 10 to the fourth, and that's not involved in significant figures. So this number has four significant. Which is smaller, three or four? Uh, time's up, hopefully you pick three. And this is the number my calculator gives me. Now, I have to round this off to three significant figures. I keep the one, keep the two, keep the three. Those are my three first three significant figures. The number I use to round off is one. Is that four or less? Yes. So this all gets dropped. So this would be 1.2 times 10 to the seventh. Remember, E is 10. Does that help? I'll tell you what, after class or my office hour tonight, I'll help you out because I got to move on. We'll, we'll get you there. Trust me, I'm a doctor. Did that work? Trust me, I'm an organic chemist. Did that work? Hopefully it did. I'll help you. Trust me. All right, where are we? All right, at this point, we've done chapter two. We've done chapter two problem sets. Hopefully you've done it. And it's time to go back to chapter three. And first I'm gonna... All right, maybe you couldn't see it. If you couldn't have seen it, whenever I'm pointing at something, because I'm still new to Zoom, or I'm not a Zoom, pro yet, uh, get on there, open your microphones and say, I can't see that, what you're talking about. 
are Now I'm going to try something different. Instead of using a PDF file, I'm going to be using Word because this way I can write on it easier with my tablet. All right. Now, a little review because review is good for your grade. Hint, hint. I talked about matter, and matter exists in three physical states of matter. And the first one is a solid. And you should know hint, big hint. I'm being subtle today. Solid, liquid, gas. Those are the three states of matter. You should know a solid has definite shape and definite volume. And this next part, I put, you can delete. Same thing here. Same thing here. I even have it here, Hint, know this. But anyways, three states of matter, and everybody together now, the first one is solid. Second one is liquid, louder. Third one is gas. And you should know a solid has definite shape and definite volume. And I talked about this yesterday. A liquid has indefinite shape. It takes on the shape of the container, but it has a definite volume. And finally, a gas has indefinite shape and indefinite volume. Talked a little about matter. There's pure substances, mixture, two things together, but they don't change their chemical identity. I see a question, maybe. All right. And elements, when we talk about elements or compounds and substances and mixtures, elements is a pure substance that cannot be broken down by chemical or physical means, meaning something like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, atoms. And a compound is a pure substance that can be broken down into two or more simpler substances by chemical means, water is one of them, sodium chloride. Ooh, time out for something from Dr. White. This is sodium chloride, NaCl. This is table salt. Hold on one second. And the next time you put some salt on your french fries or when you're cooking, that's table salt. Now, if you ever go out with the lunch, breakfast, or dinner with a chemist, especially organic chemist, you'll hear one of us say, can you please pass the knackle? Knackle. <laughs> we don't say salt. It's a bad joke. We do. So if you ever go out, I'll say, and I've done this many a times, hey, can you please pass the knackle? N-A-C-L, sodium chloride. And that's not an element. It's a compound because I can break that down to sodium and chlorine. And I talked about a mixture bringing two or more uh, substances, atoms or molecules, combined, which each one contains or retains its own chemical identity. An example of that would be if I put sugar into water, the sugar is still sugar molecules, the water is still water molecules. And you can get a mixture. 
Now, I also talked about physical and chemical properties. And physical property is something you can distinguish. An example of that would be what color is a car? What color is my shirt? How does something smell like a rose? Hopefully all taking time to smell the flowers now that they're starting to bloom and everything's growing outside. Chemical property explains how something, uh, way a substance undergoes or resists change to form a new substance. Example is iron, regular steel will rust. Gasoline is combustible. Those are chemical properties. And I also talked about yesterday, physical change and chemical change. And a physical change is when a substance changes its physical appearance, but not its chemical appearance. And when you have water going from one physical uh, state of matter to another, that's a physical change. So if you have water going from ice to liquid, that's a physical change. Chemical change, is when a substance undergoes a change in its composition. And if I were to take a piece of paper, remember I'm a pyromaniac at heart when I was little, younger, uh, if you burn a piece of paper and don't do this at home ever, the paper is no longer the molecules that make up paper. Yes, paper is a chemical. Don't think of it as such, but it is. It's actually more complex than that because there's a coating on it. That's a chemical change. I didn't really talk about energy that much. Different ways of measuring energy. Joule is one unit, kilowatt hour, you're used to that with electricity. And calories, you're used to that with food. All right, that reminds me. Tomorrow, the beginning of our Zoom meeting, I'll talk about the first lab. And if you go to Blackboard, you'll see I posted an assignment. Lab number one, I have it both what you can download as a, either Word file or PDF. You do not have to do lab number one for tomorrow. The day a lab is scheduled, I will always do an introduction first to help you understand what you're doing. Now, if you don't have a printer for labs that I hand out like tomorrow's, all you have to do is write it on a piece of paper and sometime today I'll be posting a folder and a file, how with your cell phone or smartphone, by the way, whenever I say smartphone, I wonder where can I buy a dumb phone? No, I don't want one, but anyways, uh-oh, I'm slipping into bad humor Wednesday. But I have a file, how to take pictures. If you don't have a printer, you don't have to rewrite the whole lab. This is where you have to calculate data, which tomorrow's lab I'll talk about you do. Relax, it's not that hard. And also there'll be some questions where you have to answer and you don't have to rewrite the questions. And I'll talk more about that tomorrow. Speaking about tomorrow, time for, ooh, I haven't used this all day yet, a commercial from Dr. White. And that is, and on a serious note, over the years, I've had a number of students who suffer from what I call, and other people call, test anxiety. You know the stuff, you do the practice problems, you sit down like in a classroom, or now you'll be at home to do the test, and all of a sudden your mind goes whoop and freezes or it goes that away. And that's called test anxiety. Luckily, I have a while ago come up with a method that eliminates test anxiety that you can use for both my classes and other classes. And after class tomorrow, I'll teach that to anybody who wants to stick around. I'll cut that out from the Zoom video because one of these days I'll try and sell it again. I tried and I didn't have enough money to properly advertise it. But since you're in my class, I'll do it free of charge. Well, it's not free, you have to register for the course. 
but I will do that. And so tomorrow after class, Zoom meeting, I'll teach you if you want to stick around. It takes about 10 minutes or so to learn it, for me to go through it. It's real easy. I've had students who are failing classes, not only my own, go from F or D to B or A's, and high A's. It's amazing. And I'll talk more about that tomorrow. Oh, by the way, someone just asked if you can submit the PDF or Word through assignment instead of printing it out and scanning again. Yes, if you can. Uh, that works for me as long as I can see what you're putting in the answers. All right. Now, Yesterday I sort of ended up, but it's good to go back and review because review is, guess what? Good for your grade. I think you all want to get a good grade, at least I hope so. And I talked about the temperature scales. First one is Celsius degree C. Now this is pretty new name for this because until about 1980s, they used to call it centigrade. And once in a while I'll say centigrade, but I mean Celsius. That's one temperature scale. Another one is Kelvin. And the third one, which you're most familiar with if you live in the United States, which you do, is Fahrenheit. This is the metric scale. This is the English scale. This is used for very low temperatures and gases. And this is named after Lord Kelvin. I forgot his real name, who did a lot of work in chemistry in the 1800s in England and was knighted for that, which he deserved. Oh, by the way, absolute zero, which is zero degrees K, is a temperature when everything stops. Your atoms, your, I'll talk about later on, electrons, all motion stops. And even in space, you're not at absolute zero. Now, an important part of this class is conversions. And conversions is how you go from one scale to another. If you have a number in degree C and you want to convert to Kelvin, use this formula, degree C plus 273. These are definitions. Therefore, 273 is an exact number and plays no role in the significant figures. If you want to go from Celsius to Fahrenheit, use this formula, 1.8 times degree C plus 32. Here, 1.8 and 32 are exact numbers. The only number that tells you how many significant figures your answer should have is degree C. And finally, the last one I have written here, and let's do it a better way. I'm moving my tablet. Come on. There's a better way. Degrees C. If you have Fahrenheit and you want to go to cell centigrade, Celsius, so I said I'd do it. It's degrees F minus 32 divided by 1.8. All right, as I look at my clock, it's time for a break. I'll see you back in five minutes. I'm going to do my stretching exercise. So I've been sitting and so have you all this time. And I'll see you in five minutes at 9.55.
All right, let's get back to work. But before we do that, a couple of things. I noticed some of you were talking about nursing. Uh, how many of you are nursing students or planning on going a career in nursing? Give me a thumbs up or on your video or on your uh, thing. I think a number of you are. And how many of you are going into other professions where you have to get into a program or into school? Well, if you do, especially nursing, if you get a good grade, a high B or A in my class, listen carefully. Dr. White does letters of recommendation. And I've been doing it for a number of years, and I'm always honest in my letters of recommendation to school, and that's why I limit it to a high B or an A. And because of that, I have a reputation at all the major nursing schools in the area. And in fact, I get letters from the deans of those schools do you have any good students you can send me? Because for some reason, I don't understand. I think people think chemistry is hard. It's not, it's fun. But those people go bananas when they see, oh look, a candidate that has a letter of recommendation from a chemistry instructor. And they really look hard at that. Which reminds me of another thing I'll do later in the semester, which I started a couple of years ago. Having worked in the chemical industry for many years and some other things I know, I know how to interview well. And I'll teach anybody and I'll do it, say, during an office hour, how to interview. True story, about three years or four years ago when I started doing that, I had a 12-12 student, that's organic chemistry, from COD, who went to uh, UICC nursing school or to school for an interview. And I guess there were three or four people in the room with her interviewing her. She had, I taught, that was the first year I taught, time I taught key important skills for doing a good interview. And she learned them quite well. And true story, she had her interview, I don't know how long it lasted, half hour, hour, whatever. And they said, thank you, we'll get back to you. And it was in a big building at UICC. And by the time she walked about 10 feet out the front door, because she had to take an elevator down, her cell phone rang. And she said, hello. And it was one of the people in the committee who just interviewed her. And they said, could you come back up again? And she said, sure. She came up and said, what's up? And they said, you know something? You, we all agreed. You just gave the best interview we've ever had. And we don't even have to think about it. If you're interested, we're offering you a spot in our nursing school right now. And why did she do, how was she able to do that? Because she used the skills I taught her. They're very powerful and most people don't know. And later in the semester, I'll teach you that. So anyways, let's get back to chemistry. Now, here are these three formulas. Now, in the past, I used to tell students, know these formulas. Actually, I would have not only know, memorize these formulas. Now, something I started doing about a year and a half, maybe a little longer ago, is in my general chemistry courses like this, 1211, instead of testing for how much you can memorize and apply, I'm just testing how much can you apply? And therefore, on test number one, at the end of the PDF file packet, you'll get and download, there'll be a page that says important information. And certain formulas, I no longer ask students to memorize, and those three, I will. And here, these three, you will be given and I like it this way. Now, a couple important things. Common mistakes students make in this one. You multiply this number times degree C before you add 32. I'm telling you this so you don't make that mistake on test number one. You multiply this times degree C before you add 32. Common mistake in this formula. You subtract 32 from degrees F before you divide by 1.8. So 
students usually do this by 1.8, this by 1.8, and you get the wrong answer. You have to do what's in the bracket first. All right, let's have some fun with these formulas. All right, let's take a look at this. It's time for me to teach you a little about how to do a problem. These are called word problems. Relax, take a deep breath. The first thing I do when I see a word problem, relax, I'll teach you how to do them, is look at what am I being asked to find? And we're being asked to find what's the temperature in degrees out. I don't know how I came up with this, but it works real good. I'll do a question mark and put the units of what I'm trying to find. What am I given? Degree C. Notice this is three significant figures. That's important when you're writing down numbers like this. Now, what do I know? Well, if you look at the formula, Hi, um, you know, sorry, professor. can everybody see this? I'm not, no, we're All not right. looking at Hold that. On. Now, can you see it? Everybody see it now? Hold on, let me look at some of your pictures. Everybody see that now? Okay, you can. That happens with Zoom. I always think when you go from one word to another, it does, and you got it. It's a problem. All right, let's do this again. Instant replay. Question is, if the outside four points, hint, hint, if the outside temperature, and I on a test I'd write out, print out all the temperature, is 25 degrees C, then what is, or the inside, outside is 25 degrees C, then what is the outside temperature in degrees F? First thing I do, question mark, what am I being asked to find? Next, what am I given? Then I know the formula which you'll be given. And that, and what's my degree C? Well, I look over here. Once you do this, you never have to look up here again. So I have 1.8 times 25.0 plus 32. And now, give me a second. I'll get this number and I'll take this. I have its formatted on your calculator, it might do plus 32, and you get this number. Now, if we go back, notice that 25.0 is the only number that you would use to determine significant figures. 
because 1.8 and 32 are exact numbers, part of the definition of what degrees F is equal to, this. Therefore, my answer should have three significant figures, and that would be degrees F. Now, let me teach you something very important. When you show your work, I can give partial credit. If you were to just put down 76.0 and not show your work, that would be wrong. I give you seven points, zero points. If you showed your work and you put down 76.0, I said, oh, you pushed the wrong button on your calculator, math error. And I only take off one point for math errors, and therefore you get three out of four points. So one, it helps to show your work. Two, I have found, and I have taken more tests by the time I got my PhD than you have at this point in your career, somewhere along the line, I found out the more I let the paper do the thinking, the higher my scores were on tests, which is a good thing. How does paper think? Well, you write down things, you don't keep it in your head. Now, if you notice what I did here, I wrote down what am I trying to find. I wrote down what I'm given. I wrote down, and let me check again. Can everybody see this right here? Good. That's one problem I have with Zoom. I don't always get on the right page that's showing to you, sharing. But anyways, I show the formula, put the number in, and once I do this, it's downhill, easy. All right, I'm going to share part of the fun. What I'd like you all to do is right here somewhere on your own, figure out what are you being asked to find and what are you given? That's all I'm asking you to do right now. Figure out what are you being asked to find and what are you given? I'll give you 28.6 seconds, I'll less than that, 15.2 seconds, go. Uh, time's up. What are you being asked to find? What's the temperature in Kelvin? And what I like to do is, that's what I'm trying to find out. What are you given? This temperature. In the important information for test one and other test two, You'll be given this formula. And therefore, to get Calvin, I do this. And here, your addition, you get the same number of significant figures past the decimal as the number that has the number, and this is the only number you use, that has the fewest significant figures past the decimal, this is zero. And therefore, this would be
if I did my math correctly, I'm doing it in my head. I see someone had a question. Hold on. And that should be K, not C. All right, come on, Pam. And that's how you do it. And once again, all I'm going to ask you to do is, what are you being asked to find? What are you given? See somebody already beat me with the right answer, but let's do this. Let me see something now. All right. I'm running out of room here. I'm still, I thought I could do something and the next time I know what I have to do. What are you being asked to find? Degree C, what are you given? 354 degrees F. And let's try this. You're given this, you're trying to find this, and the answer is degree C equals degrees F minus 32, you'll be given this formula divided by 1.8. I see a lot of people. All right, let me do this. All right, so what do you do? You put that in. You wait until I get my calculator. Hopefully you can all see it. So the first thing I'm going to do is plus 354 minus 32. Then I'll take that number and divide it by 1.8. And my calculator gives me this number. Can everybody see? Let me do a quick check. Can everybody see the spreadsheet? Yep, thank you. I like how everybody does their thumbs up. Nobody's done this yet, thank you. <laughs> and the question is, what's the right number? If you put this number down, I'll take off a point. On a test, if you put the wrong significant figures, I'll take off. Now, if we look at the original calculation, it was 354 degrees F. How many significant figures? Three. 1.8 and 32 are exact numbers. Therefore, you round this off to three significant figures. 
keep the one, keep the seven, keep the eight. This is the number you use to round off. Is that four or less or five or higher? And hopefully I'll pick five or higher. I drop all this past the decimal, increase that, and the correct answer is 179. And let me get back to my And that's how you do it. Wrong one. Right one. So this is how you use these formulas. Now, I have some other stuff here. Something I will be doing during the semester to have everybody's attention. At times, I will do the following. Click. I've just turned off the switch. Will this stuff be on a test? That means I'm going to cover some stuff. I just want to cover quickly because I'm supposed to, but I won't put it on my test. And you have everybody around you in Zoom as witness. I said that. Plus, I'll be on the tape video too saying that. So you got that as a witness. All right. Now, your book talks about, and we'll have to do this in a lab, but it will not be on a test, heat capacity. That's all substances have a measured amount of heat. And here's the formula for that. Mass times uh, temperature change times, uh, I forgot what C is, uh, delta C should be, delta T. And that will be discussed in the lab. And if you look at, ooh, time to tell you a special secret. You look at the corner uh, right down here, notice this page 18 of 19, why am I, or I'm on page 19, page 19 and 19, which means I'm done with chapter three. All right, listen up. This is summer, we're moving at a faster pace. Tomorrow, I will go through the there are two, not one, but two practice problems for chapter uh, three. There's one for temperature, and there's one just in general questions like, what are the three states of matter? Hopefully all remember, solid, liquid, gas. Which means it's, <laughs> Time for a new chapter, chapter four. Give me a second, I gotta close some stuff up. Hold on. I think my experiment with Word, I'll go back to
using PDF because I see the problem I'm having now and you are too. All right, let me do a quick check. Everybody see chapter four? You see it? Good, thank you. All right, finally, it's time to get into some good chemistry. And chapter four talks about atoms and elements. And again, tomorrow I'll do chapter three problem sets or two of them. What's an atom? I'll never ask you on a test, but I'll use the word. Atom is the smallest particle of an element that retains all the characteristics of an element. In case you are wondering, it comes from the Greek word meaning indivisible. And however you pronounce that, that's an atom. Now, switch is still off now. Back about 1800, chemists had these wild ideas what was going on, what were compounds and everything. And a great, one of the great chemists, I don't know if even at that point they call them chemists, was Dalton. Dalton's English. And he came up with atomic theory. Elements are made up of small particles called atoms. At that time, this was earth shaking. And a lot of people, scientists, didn't even believe this for a number of years. Atoms of a given element are identical to one another and different from other elements, which means if I have a sodium atom, it's always a sodium atom and it's different from oxygen atoms. Also, atoms of two or more different elements combine to form compounds. Therefore, if I take hydrogen and oxygen, I can combine it to make water. And a particular compound is always made up of the same kind of atoms and the same number. And again, this was all earth shaking shattering and people didn't at first believe all this. Luckily, they finally did. That is a chemical reaction involves rearrangement, separation, or combination of atoms. This is very important. Atoms are never created or destroyed during a chemical reaction. You're just changing where they are connected to each other. And that's something I've done in my life many times to make new compounds such as fabric softeners, chemicals that hold sand together to make the mold for your car engines, a whole lot of areas I've worked in. Click, switches back on. And if this were a dial and I could turn it to 10, I've just turned it to 15. By the way, I stole that from the movie Spinal Tap. Let's see. Sorry about that. Whoever that was, it ain't no more. I know the phone number. I screened my phone calls. All right, I just turned the switch up to 15. All right, when we talk about the part of the atom, parts of the atom, what things make up the atom, we have something called subatomic particles. Those are very small particles that are the building blocks of atoms. How many of you have ever heard the term submarine? Like Yellow Submarine, one of my favorite Beatles songs, and relax, I'm not going to sing it. That really ruined your day. But anyways, remember we all live in, I said I was going to say, a submarine, sub means under, marine, water, that's a boat that goes under the water. So when we talk about subatomic particles, those are particles that are smaller under an atom. And this is very important now. There are three subatomic particles. The first one is the electrons. The electrons are subatomic particles that possess a negative charge. You should know this.
I'm being subtle, not. All right, so electrons are one of the subatomic particles. The next one is the protons. And protons are subatomic particles that have a positive charge. So electrons, negative charge. Protons, positive charge. And finally, the third and last subatomic particle that makes up an atom are the neutrons. And neutrons are particles that have no charge. So the three subatomic particles, everybody together out loud. First one, electrons. Second one, protons. And the last one, neutrons. And every element in our life, in our universe, are made up of these three building blocks, subatomic particles. Electrons, negative charge. Protons, positive charge. Neutrons, negative charge. How many of you have ever heard of or seen the cartoon program, Jimmy Neutron? I don't know if any of you have seen it. It was popular a number of years ago. Well, if they had asked me, I wouldn't have called it Jimmy Neutron because the neutrons are important, but they're dull. I would have called that program Jimmy Electron because the most exciting part of an atom are the electrons. Dr. White loves messing with electrons, and I have throughout my whole chemical career. When you make something new, and I'll teach you that later on, what are you dealing with? The electrons. So you should know the subatomic particles, electrons, negative charge, protons, positive charge, neutrons, no charge. Now, back about 1900 or so, give a couple of years, switches on quite high. People were wondering, well, where are these subatomic particles? How do they exist? And one of the first persons to come up with ideas was Thompson, who I believe was American, but I might be wrong. And Thompson did experiments which was something we call the cathode ray tube. The cathode ray tube, you know as, maybe you don't. Now I'm gonna do a generation gap thing. How many of you ever seen a TV with the old picture tubes? Have you ever seen that? Google it. Oh, I just did something I rarely do. Use Google as a verb. Well, those are actually cathode ray. You know, the big tube, not like the flat screen TVs we have nowadays. And I had those until the late 90s, which I guess is before most of you are born. Oh, anyways, uh, well, the way they work is you have an electron stream coming and you have magnets and it hits the front of the screen, which has chemicals called phosphors, that when the electrons hit it, light it up and you see the picture. Well, before TV was even invented, but the cathode ray was around, Thompson found out that what is actually going on are the electrons, and he was able to prove they had a negative charge. And therefore, his cathode ray tube experiments proved electrons have a negative charge. You should know this. Again, Dr. White's being subtle. If I look at the clock, I see, uh-oh, I'm out of time. Don't forget tonight at 6, I'll have my office hours if you have any questions. Uh, don't forget tomorrow, I will be talking about the lab. You do not have to do anything with it at this point. You might want to download it if you want, either as a PDF or a Word file. And I'll see you tomorrow. Gain gazoon, be healthy. And if anybody has any questions, I'll stick around for a couple of minutes.